Blackboard Collaborate, formerly known as Illuminate, is a great tool for adding a little bit of interactivity to your online courses. Now, most of the online courses that USF offers are designated as asynchronous, so you can't base your whole course around it. But on the other hand, you can have some optional sessions. In fact, I often use Illuminate, or now Blackboard Collaborate, in my face-to-face -face classes and have a week or two of those classes online. That prepares my students in the event we have an outage such as a hurricane, and it also gives them a little bit of exposure to what it might be like to collaborate remotely, which is a big deal in the software industry where a lot of the production is done in places like India. The topics that we're going to cover are how to set up a collaborate session as an instructor, how to access those sessions and provide access to outsiders as well, what it's like to participate in a collaborate session, and that's a very long segment within the video, and the use of collaborate for proctoring purposes when you're administering examinations, which is one of the ways that I have most frequently used it in my online programming course. One of the problems with asynchronous courses is that students can often feel a little bit disengaged by the whole process. One of the things that you can do to increase that sense of engagement is to run occasional Blackboard Collaborate sessions. Ironically, even if those sessions are optional, it gives the students a sense of much greater instruction, instructor involvement. Uh, I ran a course uh, a year ago, a programming course, and I had collaborate sessions uh, at, at regular times, probably three or four times a week. Uh, the interesting thing about that is most of the sessions, nobody showed up. I just had the session running. But uh, by the uh, end of semester uh, evaluations, uh, I got great marks for availability. And so I think it's useful to have sessions like this, and uh, they're really easy to do. So what we're going to do now is first we're going to set up a, a session, and then we'll go into a session. And when I say we, I mean me and my tablet, uh, so that I have at least one other participant. So the first thing that you need to do is to create a session. Let me just add that you can record sessions, and the recordings are also accessible in this Blackboard Collaborate link. As I think I showed in the course navigation, this is not a default link that appears on your menu, so you may have to go into settings and drag it up. But at any rate, we will create a session. I'll call this one Demonstration Setting. And we'll actually try to adjust the spelling so it actually says demonstration session. Uh, we'll start now, and I'll send an end time. Uh, it doesn't really matter, but I guess I'll just uh, use the default end time 5:45. You know, two hours from now. Uh, the early entry means people can get in before the start time, which is useful except when the start time is now. All right, so. Uh, now I could click create, create, create Session right now, but what I'm going to do instead is just quickly go through some of the options so that you're aware of what's available. Uh, grant participants full default permissions. You don't have to give them the ability to use the audio or the whiteboard or the video. I tend to do this unless there's a very good reason not to hide attendee names and recordings. I usually keep my recordings accessible only through um, Canvas, so it's not really that relevant. Everyone as a moderator is one that you I would typically consider checking in this course because we've got instructors. Moderators have certain privileges that other individuals don't have. Uh, if I were setting up a session at the request of students, which I sometimes do, I usually check this as well because Otherwise, the students may not be able to do certain things. Um, enable in-session invitations. This allows you to create a web link that can be sent off to uh, people in order to uh, have them join the session, even if they're not within Canvas. 
enable session teleconferencing. This actually allows people to call in and they will give you phone numbers that you can call in for. Private chat messages are supervised. I will often check this one. Uh, what that means is when students start sending messages back and forth to each other about entirely different topics from the discussion as a whole, I get to watch them. I usually tell the students uh, about that, but uh, they're remarkably uninhibited. <laughs> Participants raise hands upon entering the system, uh, session. This is just a good way of telling who came in. I usually don't do it. It's too annoying. Uh, recording mode manual, you can also have it automatic or disallowed. Uh, what manual does is it means that I have to start up the recording, which is usually a good idea because most of the time the first 15 or 20 minutes of session is just audio tests and that sort of thing. And you don't really need that <laughs> recorded. Maximum simultaneous talkers is something that you uh, definitely need to think about. Uh, I usually set this to uh, two or three. Uh, the more talkers you have, the greater the possibility that you'll run out of bandwidth. Uh, if you just have one talker, what happens is a lot of times students will forget to turn off their microphone, and then you'll have to turn it off for them. And um, what you don't want to do is feel like you're censoring people, or rather you don't want them to feel that you're censoring them. Uh, maximum simultaneous cameras, uh, I don't really care. Uh, once again, it's just a matter of bandwidth because you will find that sometimes people do not have very good connections uh, for Collaborate, though that is getting a little better. Content I don't normally uh, work with. This is where you've got sessions with a whole bunch of activities and you can preload them. And so uh, you can preload files. Uh, such as a whiteboard plan, lesson plan, and you can actually go into a session and create these plans if you want to. My sessions are rarely that structured. It might make sense, for example, for multimedia files, because that way uh, you can send them out without uh, you know, waiting for them to load. But once again, I don't typically do that in my sessions. So what I will do now is I will create the session and now you can see we've got the phone numbers and the pins. Now the guest link is important because the guest link allows you to invite people and you just copy this link and send it to them and then anybody can come into the session through this link uh, and each session has its own unique link so once this session's over it'll no longer work. Uh, generally, if I'm going to have guests, which I sometimes do, in fact, frequently do in case discussions, uh, I will run a test session with them before. Uh, one of the things you have to make sure is that you've got a current version of Java and that sort of thing. Uh, and so it's sometimes easier uh, just to do that in a test session. Uh, if I'm going to be using Illuminate a lot during the course of the semester, <laughs> my first meeting tends to be a kind of test session. And so I always emphasize the fact that people will not be penalized for that. But if I were to do a copy of this link here and send it to someone, uh, what would happen is they would be able to join the session and uh, they would not require a password. They would just have to put in there uh, a name that they were going to use and uh, then they would be in the session. And in fact, I'm going to do that with my tablet PC so that uh, I have myself coming in, in my mo as a moderator and my tablet will be a participant. So when you or your students want to launch the session, it's really very simple. You simply go to the Blackboard Collaborate link. Uh, and if the session's active, you'll see this purple button. If it's not active, uh, you will see uh, uh, either nothing or it will be uh, grayed out. Uh, you can search for all upcoming sessions. Uh, if the session is not there, you can look at expired sessions. I wouldn't have either in this. And um, so you could also go to recordings. Uh, there are two ways to get into a session, as I indicated. One would be to come over here, take the guest link, and paste this into your browser's address window, and uh, that will get you into the session 
as a guest, you will not be a moderator unless it was set up for everyone to be a moderator. The normal way students will get in is by clicking this button here, uh, and that's how I'm going to do it. Now, uh, depending on the browser, you'll be asked to run various programs. You may end up having to uh, update your Java the first time that you've done it. Uh, uh, you may be asked to run different software. Uh, don't worry, this is supposed to happen. Okay, and um, I have now uh, joined the session. What I'm going to do here is I'm just going to uh, bring in the window so that you can actually see the whole thing. And once you've done this, you don't have to keep Canvas open or anything. And uh, because I'm a moderator, it gave me a recording uh, window. Uh, I think I will actually record this session so that uh, we can <laughs> review it at some later time if anyone has the slightest interest. So when I click the button, it tells me. Recording started. And now uh, we're in the session. Uh, one of the things that I often do when I'm running this, since I have two monitors, is actually move stuff around uh, and put some pieces in some monitors, some pieces in other monitors. Uh, right now, I don't have much going on in the chat window since uh, the only other person to chat with is me. So what I'm going to do is, whoops, ah, I've managed to move the participant window out of the way. Let's just bring in the view. I'll restore, restore my default layout, and now I can find it again. And what you notice is that we've got two participants here. One is my tablet, and then the other is me, and I'm a moderator, uh, and you can tell that because uh, it's dark. Now, if I wanted to give my tablet moderator privileges, if I right-click and uh, go down to give moderator privileges, I can do that, and that would, uh, so you can make anyone a moderator if you want. Okay, so I'm now just going to go over a variety of the features. Uh, one of the things that I like about a tablet is the ability to actually um, use pens on the whiteboard. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to write on my tablet as opposed to the other screen as a guest. So uh, Okay, so that gives you an idea of just how bad my handwriting is. Ironically, though, I prefer to use handwriting as opposed to uh, typing when I'm doing, say, a case discussion. That allows me to do things like uh, draw diagrams and that sort of thing. And uh, the reason for writing is not necessarily to have everyone take notes, but it is... Uh, it, it's a way of helping focus people's attention. Now, the whiteboard um, allows you to do a whole bunch of other things besides write on it. First off, you know, there are all sorts of different things you can write. For example, I could type text. Uh, I could come over here. I could change the text to make it a little bigger. Uh, I'm off the screen now, but I'll make it a 72-point font and then bold it and then maybe change its color. Uh, the color wheel is off the screen, but so you've got that. Uh, you have uh, the ability to draw figures, you know, and of course you can change the color and, you know, I, all of that stuff is... Uh, you know, relatively uh, straightforward. People tend to have a lot of fun. You can do a screen capture uh, and paste that on the uh, whiteboard. And these are all drawing features. You can embed an image 
on the whiteboard. So for example, if I were to, uh, you know, wanted to post a map of the United States, there's various clip art. If I were to uh, uh, upload images, that's something that I can also do. All right, so that's the basics. Now, the whiteboard allows you to create new pages at any time. It saves the old page unless you erase them, so I can go back to the old page. Uh, and everyone in the session will see whatever page I'm looking at as long as I have this check mark here, which says uh, follow the moderator. If I uncheck it, then everybody has control of their own whiteboard. Uh, one of the things that you can do is you can upload PowerPoints uh, to the whiteboard. So if we were to uh, upload the PowerPoint, which is up here under load content. And so I can come over here. Um, and what it actually does when you load PowerPoint is it, uh, let's see here if we can find faculty workshop. Uh, maybe we'll bring in the uh, slides for this one. Collaborate. So we go open. What it actually does is it runs PowerPoint, generates images. <laughs> and of course, I actually have that window open. So uh, what I'll have to do is uh, close it. Let's try that again. All right, we'll try that again. Uh, because what it actually does is it uses the uh, PowerPoint converter to generate images. Uh, uh, so you're not going to get animations or things when you uh, do the PowerPoint. But now, if we take a look here at my pages, I can actually see uh, it uses the uh, uh, various topics. So we can go here, setting up topics and the various slides that I created. Uh, we'll go back to the public page. Uh, so that students can give presentations, they can share things with each other. There's a page explorer that allows you to resequence pages. You can change the titles of pages. And so the whiteboard is a very flexible tool, and it's the tool that I use by far the most often when I am working uh, in uh, Collaborate. Okay, so. Uh, some of the other capabilities of uh, Collaborate. Uh, obviously, you can talk, and what I'm going to do now is I am going to uh, talk into the thing. So I am now, uh, it's telling me I can't connect the white microphone, so we'll begin with the audio setup wizard. Uh, part of the reason for that is that uh, I'm using a headpiece instead of my normal microphone here. So we'll go to the audio setup wizard and uh, we will, oh no, I guess that's okay. Uh, we we'll use speakers is okay. Welcome to the audio setup wizard. Okay. So, yes. Now what I need to do is identify the fact that I'm going to use my webcam as a microphone. Okay. Now we'll test the recording. And this may not work because I've already got Camtasia capturing the microphone. We'll see what happens. Can we actually capture this microphone? Happens. Can we actually capture this microphone? So it looks, uh, I, I meant to click yes. I have to try this again. I have to try this again. This is something you have to be careful for, and this is one of the biggest sources of problems that you sometimes tend to have, is that uh, you do in fact have issues when you've got more than one microphone going. So when I actually connected to the camera, it actually uh, changed all my audio settings. Uh, and uh, what I am now going to do is just demonstrate some of the other things uh, that we can do. Um, first off, when students have audio problems, and this is probably the most common problem that you have, you 
go to Tools, Audio, Audio Setup Wizard. You saw me do that before. And that will solve probably 80% of the problems. Another problem that we sometimes run into is what happens when individuals have both a speaker and a microphone. And so I'm going to talk from my tablet, and because we've got a couple of mics going, we'll see some of the problems that occur. So, so now, now, I'm now I'm talking from my tablet, my tablet and we're getting that. Feedback. Uh, and so that's another thing that you need to be aware of. I don't usually use a, a lot of uh, video, but video is available, and frankly, the tablets do a wonderful job. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to do a video feed from my tablet, which is sitting right next to me. And so now you can see me, uh, and as I turn to my other screen, <laughs> uh, you can see my profile as I'm now looking at my main screen. Uh, and uh, there's a certain number of video settings that you can have, uh, but it does use up bandwidth. Illuminate is pretty good with bandwidth. What it does is it tends to prioritize things. And so um, things like the audio uh, never gets lost. But sometimes what happens is if there's a bandwidth problem, it'll basically cache the audio. And then uh, as soon as it can get the bandwidth, it'll start playing it very fast. So sometimes it will sound like one of your students is a chipmunk. This frequency of this type of problem has been declining over time as uh, large bandwidths become much more common for our students. In fact, virtually all of our students have broadband now. All right, if you haven't used Illuminate, here's a, just a quick wrap up of some of the features you need. Uh, if you see this hand here, a student can raise their hand. And this is a good way of, uh, so I'll raise my hand here. It creates a ding, and uh, that little number here tells you how many people have raised their hands. And so uh, it will provide you a way of deciding who to call on first. I'll now lower my hand here. Uh, you can ask students to display emoticons. Uh, so if they're happy, they can click on this laughing, applause, some others, uh, disapproval, <laughs> uh, and so forth. Uh, and I sometimes use this to get student reactions. If you take a look at the actual emoticon menu, uh, let's see, I guess we don't actually have that <laughs> available for the moderator, but other people can use it. Okay, uh, now, uh, one of the things that you can do uh, when you are uh, talking is there's a chat feature here. I'll move this chat window here. And this will show you a, sort of a history of the chat. I guess I can't moderate that. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to come over here and to my other computer. And I will say, hello, this is chat and you can see that was from Grandin's travel tablet and then I'll just say right back at you <laughs> and now uh, it's come right back to me so um, when you have that feature saying that you have the ability to uh, see all the chat, you'll also see private chats because one of the things people can do is they can identify who they want to chat to. Oh, I guess those are the, the emoticons. <laughs> They've actually changed this menu, but you can, in fact, uh, send chat to specific people uh, and... Uh, one way to do that, for example, if I just wanted to communicate to uh, Grandin's tablet, what I could do is I could come over here and send a private chat just to tablet. This is obviously is much more interesting when you have uh, lots of people in the room. So we'll go back to the room here. Uh, and uh, that's the uh, moderator 
panel. All right, so uh, we've talked about chat, we've talked about uh, webcams, we've talked about microphones. By the way, this button right here will also take you to the audio setup wizard in case people can't remember. Um, the uh, Another thing you can do is you can poll people. So, for example, uh, if you said, okay, everybody who understands what's going on, give me a check mark, then they could come over here and I'm going to do that. And you can see that Grandin's tablet just put a check mark there. So you can, and there actually, there's a polling feature. I don't use it that often, but as a moderator, one of the things that you can actually do is uh, set up different types of polls. Uh, yes, no options, what's currently there, but you can go all the way up to A through E, multiple choice. Uh, and you can also respond to the poll here as opposed to doing it in the menu. And then you can also publish the responses to the whiteboard, which is a nice feature if you've got a bunch of options. Uh, all right, let's see other things that you might want to be able to do. There is a web tour here capability. And what a web tour does is it allows you to type in a web page and then everybody will see that page in their browser. Uh, I find that that's sometimes a little confusion inducing, but it is a capability. You can also send out multimedia to people as a moderator. And the advantage of sending multimedia to people as opposed to having everybody go to a web page where there's multimedia is it's a little bit better synchronized. Uh, the uh, you have uh, various uh, different layouts that you can create here. Uh, we, I used restore default layout to find out where everything was. Um, let's see. You can set up quizzes if you want. Uh, I find that's way too much work. <laughs> and uh, too much chaos. But if I were to do it on a regular basis, as with all these things, um, it's uh, potentially useful. Now, one thing that I have found useful, and this is particularly in technical courses, is application sharing. And what this does is it allows you or a student to share their desktop. And what I'm going to do now is I'm going to uh, do application sharing for a student. Oh, apparently I haven't enabled it for myself. Uh, let's see here. I've got chat permission on. I don't have application sh uh, sharing permission. So if I click this now, uh, Grandin Tablet has application sharing permission. And so now I should be able to share my desktop. And so what I'm going to do here is I am going to uh, share my browser and so if I were to uh, go say to the University of South Florida an application sharing does not necessarily happen all that fast but now you're seeing what is on my desktop and I think this probably has something to do with the fact that I am uh, basically doing this all over the same network because the user is a little faster than this. Now, why is it scrolling? Well, because the main page of USF keeps uh, scrolling the window, and that's definitely slowing things down. Uh, perhaps if I were to go to a different window, it would not be so... Uh, yeah, that one's not as bad. <laughs> you don't want to be sending video over application sharing. But at any rate, then if I close my application share, uh, which I can do over here on the other thing, then, uh, then we don't have to do that. Now, from your own perspective, if I were to start sharing here, uh, this is basically telling me about the various privileges. Uh, I can see what applications I have. Uh, the, um, this is, I think, a file viewer, so I think maybe I'll share that. And uh, now what you would be seeing <laughs> is 
is is my file viewer on uh, but that was actually not a good choice because <laughs> what someone would see on the other illuminate screen is different from what you would have so I'll go back to the whiteboard here uh, application sharing is nice if people are having technical problems um, I think that that's pretty much everything I wanted to cover. Uh, we've talked about chat. We've talked about the audio and video. We've talked about permissions. By the way, if someone's using the microphone and you want to uh, disable it, you can just click on it, and that will stop them dead in their tracks. If you click again, it will be um, it'll return. Uh, and uh, you can disable their webcam, you can disable this uh, web tour permission, and a uh, couple more things. Uh, if you want to walk away and let everyone know that you're walking away, if you click this button, it will tell you you're away. Uh, and uh, that used to be a door, but everyone thought that meant exiting the session. <laughs> and it produced a lot of confusion. But actually exiting the session is actually really easy because all you need to do is close the window and it will typically tell you uh, if you want to leave the session. Uh, I do, so I'll click OK. And uh, it takes a few moments for the session to close down, but then it will close down and uh, We'll be ready to go back. One of the most common ways that I have used Illuminate is to proctor examinations, uh, specifically uh, Blackboard tests that draw from uh, random pools of questions. And I did this in my programming course you know with considerable success now these tests are open book tests and so as a consequence I am not at all concerned about what the student might be looking at there are really two things that I'm interested in is the student who's taking the test the one who is supposed to be taking the test and is the student who's taking the test alone and I can verify this reasonably effectively using some tools that uh, Collaborate provides very nicely. And the first thing that I would do here is I would create um, a classroom or a breakout room as it's called. And uh, as a moderator I can do this and uh, I can create as many rooms as I want to. In this particular case what I will do is I will create uh, uh, four rooms, I'll call them exam, so I'll get exam one through four, and uh, I'm going to manually move the participants into these rooms, and so when I create these rooms, what will happen is uh, now all of a sudden, if we look at the uh, participant window, and I think what I'm going to do is drag this window over and expand it so you can get a clearer idea, We've now got four rooms. Now each room is exactly like the main room in terms of its setting, and you can have students showing their webcams in the room. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to pretend that uh, the student, student demo, which is just my tablet, is going to take a test, and I am going to move him to exam room one. So I right click the student, I send to breakout room exam one. Now the student is alone in that room. I would have given the instructions to the student to set up a webcam. And so what I'm going to do now is I'm going to have that student set up his webcam in that particular room. So. And what you will now see is that there is evidence of the webcam sitting there uh, within the room. Now, what I can then do is periodically, I can just jump from room to room and verify that the student is in fact alone and taking the test. So I will go to exam room one, and uh, <laughs> you can see now 
that uh, demo student or student demo is sitting here taking the test uh, basically alone. You can have them turn on the audio or not turn it on. Uh, and with the ability to have multiple webcams going at the same time, you could have over, up to six different students displayed in each room. Now, this is not a perfect uh, proctoring. Uh, I mean, and I, if you're doing a closed book uh, examination, then I would say uh, this is not a good solution. But in general, uh, what we recommend in online courses is that you avoid high value tests uh, and instead have tests that are sort of ongoing. And this is a very reasonable way to do that. So I'm going to go back up to the main room. And uh, you can also uh, return all pro uh, students to the main room. There are other options. If you want to have students work in groups, for example, they can use uh, breakout rooms for that. And you can give them the ability to go to different breakout rooms uh, on their own. Uh, whatever goes on in the breakout room is private to the breakout room, but then they can share the uh, whiteboard that they've used in the breakout room. And uh, the only real disadvantage with breakout rooms, as far as big sessions are, is that you cannot record the contents of what goes on in a breakout room. So that you as the instructor would have to go in. Uh, only the main room is recorded. But as I say, online testing is often a major concern for individuals who are thinking about taking their courses online. While this is not a perfect solution, if you had uh, four breakout rooms with six webcams in them each, you'd be able to monitor 24 students. Uh, if you have a teaching assistant, uh, basically you can just jump from room to room. And the very fact that the students are being monitored on the webcam will tend to uh, moderate their behavior.